just a pause for reflection. Um, maybe some of you in your youth did homework by candlelight. But um, I think the, the glaring reality is that in Africa today, where there are some 500 million children of school-going age under the age of 25, the vast majority are likely to be doing just that today. Um, in the context of the original title I gave, I decided to call it challenge-based open education in Namibia and some of the realities that we face in that context. And to set the tone of what are often called my sour grapes about corporate misanthropy, I should quote um, that having proven its sustainability in Namibia, Microsoft is now ready to replicate and deploy their Pathfinder project across other regions in Africa. To date, the Pathfinder project in Namibia has rolled out 13 schools. S thus spake Jean-Philippe Courtois, the regional CEO of Microsoft recently in Namibia. Um, putting that into context and bringing it to you as one of the first issues that this conference will address, and or one of the issues, and I've brought the GNU or the Wildebeers into perspective since that was referenced yesterday by the Hewlett Foundation participants, um, is that many of the international issues that we face in an African context is that a lot of the international development players do not collaborate, do not partner with local expertise, local players that actually understand the systems better. Do we want something like this? This is a Shell, um, Shell oil company funded initiative which was left in the lurch after two years of support. Do we want the Microsoft Pathfinder that has left this kind of scenario in 13 schools in Namibia? Or do we want the latest of Microsoft type blunders in Africa where they have put 30 computers into classrooms on rickety tables where the children are being obligated to use those computers for typing lessons standing up with the keyboards on top of the monitors. Um, this is the kind of mindset that we deal with and they call that sustainability, they call that a, an example to share with the rest of Africa. And obviously, they are hard at work convincing ministers of education all over Africa that what they did in Namibia is cool and sustainable. I do not believe that something like this is sustainable. I do not believe that these folks that come into places like Namibia um, convince ministries of education that their products are hot and that their support in terms of this kind of scenario, which we call the drop and run brigade, a, a trick or treat drop and run scenario, is still the issue that we have in Namibia and many other parts of Africa. Projects like being run now by the NEPAD ECA initiative and a number of other big corporations in other parts of Africa are all very much along this line. Walk in, do a lot of quick and nasty dropping of technologies and walk away so that you leave that responsibility for support, maintenance, training, whatever else, to whoever is there to deal with that in those countries of origin. I think we want this. I think we want an environment. And as you saw in the previous pictures, there was not a single child in any one of those systems. I think it's important that we are addressing technology developments, resource developments, infrastructural capacity building in the framework of what these kids that we are trying to serve out there with teachers that need to be empowered to putting technology that have local capacity for support. Importantly, and it's a very important international issue, is that most technologies that we acquire in in the developing world, in countries like Namibia, are way, way more expensive than what you would uh, pay in a retail context here in the States or in other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. The, the critical thing for us as we see it is that for us to be able to make computers affordable and make them attractive to the clients that we deal with in an educational context in, in Namibia and further afield is to break what I call the US dollar 100 barrier. 
Nicholas Negroponte of MIT um, has come up with a vision to be able to make millions of $100 laptops available by the end of 2006. I applaud that in the context of what we know are techy, tech savvy people all over Africa using mobile phones. There are millions and millions of people all over Africa today using mobile phones comfortably, learning to use their thumbs and all those sort of things that make technologies more reachable, more approachable. And that is across all age groups. So my, my argument for an improvement in the ICT capacity of countries like Namibia is in getting that technology to under 100 US dollars. We have, at this stage in Namibia, and the illustration here is, is where it's at, um, some 15,000 dial-up internet users, some 27,000 households that use computers in Namibia in a population of 1.8 million. Do the math. It's a very, very small percentage of the total population that are actually using computers at home. Um, at the same time, though, there are 250 to 300,000 mobile phone users now in Namibia. So that tells you something when you know that mobile phones cost 100 US dollars or less. That's where we're trying to get to. And I think it's important to keep that in the back of the mind that if Nicholas gets it right, then those technologies should by right be available to African educators and the parents of learners in Africa within the next two to three years. Unfortunately, Nicholas Negroponte does not see Africa, in spite of the 500 million children there, as a, as a viable market yet. He's more interested at this stage, um, along with MIT, to push for technology deleveries at this 100 US dollar level in Brazil and in China, where obviously the markets are significantly larger than in, in Africa. But I think it's important that this model of 100 US dollars for a laptop should be brought to places where ICT development in a global context is actually happening at a work phase. Namibia is an example where ICTs are being integrated into education at levels, at national levels, unprecedented. Um, nowhere else in Africa at this stage, on a, certainly on a per capita basis, are ICTs being delivered to the education sector as they are in Namibia. As well as the, the fact that, and as we will discover from admin and policy perspectives, is that Namibia is one of very, very few countries in Africa and the rest of the world that actually has an ICT policy for education. An ICT policy for education along with an implementation plan that looks at what it's going to cost us as a country to deliver ICTs to every single school across Namibia over the next 10 to 15 years and conforming to what are considered millennium goals for primary education. Another sobering thought, aside from trying to get computers into Namibia and other parts of Africa for under 100 US dollars, is the, the, the fact that internationally we have some issues around us presently using refurbished technologies for want of anything more affordable. There's been a lot of debate, refurbs versus new, and whether refurbs are actually a, an issue because they represent a notion that Africa would just land up becoming another dump, a landfill for technologies for the first world. Now, quite frankly, whether you've got a phone, a new phone, a second-hand phone, or an old computer, or a new computer, they will represent an e-waste issue at some stage down the line, whether it's in two years, or five years, or ten years. What we face in a global context, though, is that very little attention in the first world is being paid to e-waste in general. When we look at the kind of predictions of what's being dumped out there, I believe that we can effectively, if Nicholas doesn't come right with his laptops, use what's being dumped at this stage, and very badly so in terms of environmental sustainability, all over the first world, or shipped to other parts of the developing world. And I think at this stage, while we wait for the $100 laptop, we can comfortably embrace refurbished technologies or technologies that are secondhand shipped to countries like Namibia and refurbished locally with local expertise and made available for an extension of life in schools for two to three to four years. 
at which stage they should be returned to source. Now, Namibia at this stage, and certainly Schoolnet Namibia, has reached the scenario where if you in the first world would like to donate your computers to us in an education sector commitment in Namibia, we would like you to pay us at least four euros, about six US dollars per unit delivered to us or donated to us, so that we, when that system reaches end of life in an education context in Namibia, we can put it back in a container and give it to you for your responsible disposal for environment. <laughs> Bottom line here is that most first world consumers, and certainly those of you that have European experience, are already confronted by the fact that some 60 euros, probably about 80 US dollars, is already entrenched in the cost price of that piece of computer equipment that you acquire in Europe, which is supposed to be put aside for the disposal of that computer equipment. Now, I'm a little bit confused about how these legislations allow for these consumers to then redistribute these second-hand computers to the third world, the developing world, um, ostensibly as donations. And, and I ask, and I think it's for you to think about and reflect, is what happens to the 60 euros that was paid to the, the manufacturer or the distributor of the second-hand computers when that computer equipment was shipped for free or at some nominal cost to the third world. So there's something going on which is not quite right when it comes to costs put aside, finances put aside for disposal. Right. Having given you a little international flavor and around the issues that face us in development of ICTs in Namibia, let's get on to some ICT policy situations in Namibia. And as I said, we are one of the few countries with a policy. At this stage, trying to meet what is a first world expectation of learner computer ratios in the classroom, in the school, um, in the home, and that of a one to, you know, and, and that for teachers to computers. We expect to try and get 72,000 computers every three years to conform to conventional business cycles into schools in Namibia, conditional on there being in the 1,640 schools in Namibia at least 1,640 ICT literate, ICT competent teachers to drive those technologies to the advantage of the children they're trying to empower with ICTs. But for that to happen as well, we will, will need, in an African, certainly in a Namibian context, some 650 schools given electricity. The rest have some kind of electricity. It's horrible electricity. It goes up and down, up and down. And it's a reason why we've adopted an open source platform called LTSP, where we use thin clients instead of fat clients, workstations with hard drives in them. But the point is, is that without electricity, all this effort we're putting into ICT development is a waste of time. So obviously, infrastructural capacity building is very much part of the scenario that if we want to share with our children at schools the resources that you wonderful people are developing here in the first world, we will need things like electricity and so on and so on to make it reality for those children to actually finally get to use those ICTs. Unless, of course, some of you come up with some very smart mobile phone interfaces that allow mobile phones to become an extension, last mile, last centimeter, extension of ICT development in developing countries. Mobile phones are already available and they are web and, web and internet enabled. Let's perhaps think towards that as an extension of potential ICT development in Africa. Um, we will need consistently more and more decentralized and localized technical service capacity to support the schools that acquired these technologies. And in terms of what we call a total cost of ownership, which I'll give you some ballpark figures on shortly, it's important to understand that in Namibia, we have already secured a less than US dollar 50 per month total cost of ownership in terms of service model that provides not only internet, but technical support, maintenance, training, replacement, repair, and whatever else it takes to keep those ICTs rolling in those schools. Now, that is significantly lower than what it would cost in most African countries. Part of that bundle, however, which is 
it's at this stage one of the only countries outside Egypt, which is a government-driven model, is the only country in Africa that now has a 24-7 flat rate internet solution for schools countrywide, irrespective of the medium, be it wireless or landline, copper, whatever. The point is that we can now do that in Namibia because of the engagement by partners driven by policy through the ICT policy of, for education that allows schools to get flat rate internet at 25 US dollars per month for, per school. So at 25 US dollars, that is significantly lower considering it's flat rate, 24 seven internet, than any other country in Africa. Ghana, for example, you have to pay US dollar 55 for the internet service over and above telecom costs for dial on demand. So obviously, in having secured that, as part of a policy implementation plan in partnership with what are currently telecommunication monopolies in, in Namibia, we believe that we're on the right track to putting in place affordable solutions which even very disadvantaged, very underserved schools in remote rural areas of Namibia can afford. Now, what is still missing, and I think that's where I'm so excited about being here with you this week is that there are a couple of issues that we face that are not yet met in terms of policy, in terms of vision, in terms of the frustrations of dealing with the education sector in Africa, in Namibia in particular, is that the, of empowerment of educators and the localizing and repurposing of electronic content, media, resources and whatever else. That little price tag at the bottom US dollars, 120 million, is the current prospectus projected budget to deliver 72,000 computers and the capacity around it to schools every three years. It's based on a model delivered in Jordan. And in Jordan, the folks are, spay, are paying presently, are borrowing money from the World Bank to the tune of 268 million US dollars to do 3,000 schools. So scalability requires a lot of money. Now, in an ICT development matrix, as I've put together here, um, it's important to realize that Schoolnet Namibia has addressed and tried to address through partnership with stakeholders in, in private sector, in the industry, in the public sector and through international partners like the UL Foundation and others, a solution that is fairly diverse in what it's trying to tackle in getting ICT empowered youngsters through our schooling system. Now, in all of this, I can talk for hours on all and every one of these different things that we have championed as a civil society organization in Namibia. But I think it's important that we address those three areas that are still weak in the context of where we're going today with this implementation plan for ICTs. First of all, ICT competency and the, the paradigm of how we should be addressing ICT competency not only in teachers but in the youngsters as well, the kids that go through from grade 1 through 12. But where we are trying to now as a civil society organization push the education sector and the, the formal sector is to engage in the idea that foundation and integration skills in ICT competency require some kind of localization that makes it exciting for the educators and the learners in Namibia and importantly to meet a cultural requirement, some kind of certification that makes you feel good about yourself in the context of you maybe being able to leave that environment with some piece of paper saying yes I am competent in ICTs. So obviously certification we see as a very important incentive. How it is developed in terms of an education system is up to the education, the formal pedagogues, the, the, the formal sector to decide how they do that. And there's a lot of debate presently as to whether they should be developing coursework for grade 1 through 12 or come up with some sort of ICDL, International Driver's License model, that says that whenever you feel you're ready to get these foundation and integration skills, you're ready to write the exams and pick up your certificate if you pass. So there's quite a lot of interesting debate of how to address competency and the way to measure, evaluate, and then obviously certify those kind of people. 
The other glaring issue that we have in Namibia and all over Africa is obviously infrastructural capacity, as I've pointed out earlier, but also bandwidth. Bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth. It's a fundamental problem right across the continent. We are paying way, way too much to gangsters in the first world for broadband access. And quite honestly, if we are going to scale up internet access, which is so important to what you folks are doing with content today, we're going to have to collectively, through the World Summit for Information Society, the United Nations ICT Task Force, and other major players, the foundations like Hewlett and Ford and whoever, the Kellogg Foundation, whoever, has the capacity to pick up the phone and speak to Kofi Annan and say, Kofi, it's time to talk to Bill. And convince him that you and the rest of the monopolies around corporate commitments to ICTs that include birds in the sky and fiber running around the continent of Africa and the bandwidth that goes along with that should be given in the context that Africa is seriously disadvantaged, seriously underserved, and that there must be some philanthropy around that ICT delivery in an African context. Schoolnet Namibia on its own cannot stand up and yell at the International Telecommunications Union and say, you are ripping us off in Namibia. We need a collective effort by countries in SADC in the Southern African region, the all of Sub-Saharan Africa, to shout and say, that we are paying between four and 10 times more than the average household in the United States or in Sweden is paying for the bandwidth that we have available to us today. So scale depends entirely now on the first world coming to the table with realistic pricing for international bandwidth. Right, overcoming local barriers. And the, I'm bringing some new perspectives to that. Um, Schoolnet has over the six years that it's been around, um, done a hell of a lot. We've, done, we've diversified. In fact, we've stretched ourselves quite thinly on the ground at times to meet so many of the, what we believe are obligations to the young people that we serve around schools in Namibia. And that comes around to what we are doing and what we have been doing in the past. In the past, we did a lot of things. And one of those, for example, was providing electricity to schools through putting in solar power solutions. We've got some great solar power models, which we'd love to share with the energy sector in Namibia. Energy sector in Namibia has not quite yet come to the table in terms of embracing, adopting, and actually to running with the idea of giving 650 schools electricity in Namibia. However, there's some models that we've developed. We've obviously been, from the beginning, committed to youth empowerment through internet. And we have, up until quite recently, been the internet service provider to all schools through the Schoolnet ISP. That's been given to what is now called the Xnet Development Alliance, which is a foundation sharing cost and commitment between Schoolnet and the telecommunication monopolies, state-owned monopolies, and they have committed a serious amount of money towards the school internet solutions that are presently in place and are being expanded as we speak. We look at that internet solution as we provide through Schoolnet and now through Xnet as a subsidy model that will ultimately see a universal service fund or an access fund become the buffer for those costs that we would otherwise expect the schools to find through paying us 100 um, 65 rand or it's 25 US dollars a month. So from, from what we have now, that's something that's become less important since we have this confidence in our telecommunications operators to carry the bulk of that responsibilities. While we are and have been a civil society with a very strong social activism component to it and, and lobbying government and lobbying industry to change their ways and to get policies to actually recognize things like open source and open standards and 2.4 gigahertz wireless internet solutions. Um, we now also have a more body neutral, uh, or more um, neutral cross-sectoral participation from different parts of the sector through the ICT Alliance of Namibia. And I see from a civil society point of view that this ICT Alliance of Namibia will carry a lot more of this activism to convince government to change policy. So where does it leave Schoolnet? Schoolnet today 
still has a huge range of things to a range, a range of things to do, from strengthening ICT skills with its volunteer pool, to delivering educational content through Open Lab, a software package, an operating system open source developed by African Geek for African people with our help in providing them with the guinea pigs to say what an education sector like Namibia would need. We build, install, maintain and keep computer labs going all over the country. And we do that through satellite tele technical service centers and through our head office in Windhoek, the capital city. But importantly here we are driving towards a decentralization model that we can decentralize the capacity to support schools all over the country. Um, we buy and sell and trade and make deals to get better and more affordable and more sustainably affordable solutions and quality solutions into the schools through a business model that says that if we put some margin on some of the things that we sell and, and argue for better discounting on the stuff we buy, contra going through government tender policy systems, tenders that land up in being manipulated by greedy corporate, corporates, I think we have, as part of the school net stable, a business model that says we can get affordable technologies into schools. We have a help desk. It's probably the only country in Africa where schools can actually phone a toll-free number to get a hold of somebody to say, hey, I am having a problem with the internet. Can you help me, please? It's the only one in Africa. It's scary. But schools do need a help desk. They need a toll-free number. They need a place to phone when there's problems. And that's something that Schoolnet has really worked hard to, uh, to evolve. Um, strengthening ICT skills and capacities, we have a increasingly larger and larger pool of local unemployed youth that come to us desperate for some sort of ICT skills development opportunities. These are volunteers. These are the people that we adopt, bring into Schoolnet to transfer skills on a peer-to-peer -peer basis to others in Namibia. And this model, which we call we call the Kids on the Block Schoolnet Volunteer Program, has continued to burgeon and grow. We are not in any way short of young Namibians wanting to gain skills. The distinction between ourselves and, and a recent effort by Microsoft in pushing the same sort of model is that we offer skills development from a school net perspective for free. Microsoft has a refurbishment center where they charge 7,000 Namibia dollars rand um, for a little six month training course if you want to learn the skills that you can get at school net for free. So obviously in Namibia there's some competition, which some people argue competition is healthy. I think it's important to understand that we have created a number of paradigms and scenarios that make it possible for us to get young people to go to skill schools to teach young people. We have market advantage. And we've had that fairly consistently from the beginning and we continue to have it. There is, um, Schoolnet has put free and open source solutions into schools since 2000 and we are now just hovering around the 350 mark. We expect to go beyond 400 if we get a little bit more money together from various operational partners. But um, as you can see, there's been relatively little growth in other platforms in Namibia. And that's largely for reason that the, the schools that do have non-free and open source platforms are mostly privileged schools private schools that have consistently been able to afford to pay for commercial support. So they're quite comfortable in that context. The additional 26 odd schools that Microsoft has brought into underserved communities, I don't think will last. And a lot of them are coming back to us now asking for upgrades to a better platform. Young, enthusiastic, bright Namibians, mostly women, are the hub the operational hub, the core, the, the process, the success of Schoolnet. It's not me shouting at Microsoft. It's this incredible group of young Namibians, aged between 19 and 26, that we use to deploy technologies all over the country. And we use some plain common sense and a bit of lateral thinking and making it easier for classrooms to embrace ICTs without being a burden in terms of technical support and maintenance, and obviously in terms of how kids and teachers um, make change possible around didactic models that have conventionally been rows uh, with a teacher in front of a chalkboard to something that allows for more interactive learning and learner-based 
systems. The round table model is an innovation in its own right in that we use cheap shutter board, we use second hand um, broken down tables as you saw the rickety tables in the Microsoft picture and we brace those round old, old tables on top, underneath one of these round tables and provide for a resource like that that keeps our techies out of those classrooms because it eliminates one of the biggest problems we've had in schools, that is that of cabling. A lot of teachers had a tendency when we still had them in rows to remove cables to boil water or to charge mobile phones or do various crazy things with the cabling that was put together for those computer systems. We talk now of a five-year cost of ownership and support model for schools in Namibia around these round table tops and you can see the little, the, the little tables underneath the, the shutterboard. A shutterboard solution like that costs 500 rand, divide that by six and you've got about 80 US dollars. So it's, it's not a lot of money to put a round table into a school coupled with the technologies that we deliver. When SchoolNet delivers computers to schools, it delivers modules of five at a time along with a server. A new server with a number of two hard drives, lots of RAM, um, an Intel inside processing system processor and a bunch of second-hand refurbished thin clients that do not have hard drives. The beauty of the thin client open source solution is that you don't need UPSs, uninterrupted power supplies, to keep those clients running on those tables. We have a UPS for the server, and if there are problems with electricity, at least we don't have the problem that so many of the fat client workstation solutions have out there, because electricity surges damage the hard drive first, and then other things subsequently. Without hard drives, it makes these systems far more effective. Now, when we deploy technologies to schools, and this is a, a, a major shift from what the drop and run brigade have been doing, is that we make sure that our development partners understand that when we put technologies into school, we don't just walk and drop it off and walk away. We provide a sense of what the annualized cost of support, maintenance, internet, electricity, and everything else that comes along is part of the equation. Now, based on some um, slightly old figures here, but I mean, the bottom line here is that, sure, a startup cost, a capital investment at a school would be about 16,000 US dollars if you've got 10 to 20 computers. We can dramatically change that. That 461.54 should be 100 US dollars or less. So obviously, a server should be less if people woke up to, to pricing that is, is not affected by claimed distances between source and Namibia. But if we change that figure from 461 to 100 and look at the scalability of from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 computers in a classroom, we accommodate the electricity requirements and other infrastructure requirements that often are not thought of when people drop computers off at school. Then we are looking now at a system where the initial cost of capital investment is a very small percentage of the total cost of support over three to five years. School that is into three to five year support models. We provide them with everything over that time and that is factored in to this model, which includes annualized costs and we make very, very sure that schools pay some part of this in terms of a service fee. Nothing is for free. Service, if you want it, is going to cost you some kind of money. But this is the model that we've now used with the Global eSchools and Community Initiative to submit some new reality around what it costs to put computers into schools and give them internet over three to five years at the summit that's happening in Tunisia later this year. What is it about SchoolNet? What is it about OpenLab? Open Lab it's not just a computer system, second-hand computers. It's, it's not just a free and open source software. But it's a whole range of things that is often overlooked in what we deliver. When we start talking open lab, and I've got a new live CD here for those that want to burn it and rip it, um, is that we provide not just computers and software. We provide a whole range of services. And I believe that in an African context, a SchoolNet Africa model that SchoolNet should be delivering a range of different solutions. Service, maintenance, repair, you name it, as part of the bundle. And somebody's going to have to pay for that, be that government or the World Bank 
or development partners. But somebody will have to pay for that and, and realize that these are the fundamental issues. Right. An important step forward that we believe we've taken in Namibia is shifting the free Libra open source market paradigms. We are not selling you a Ferrari or a Porsche with some gorgeous woman standing next to it saying this thing is faster and sexier and whatever else than the next model down the road. We are looking at a reality in Namibia and I think it's a reality that we must heed all over Africa that we need to make people understand that open source is no different to any of the other proprietary solutions that it's no big deal to use an open source solution and that an open source solution uses control C and right click and all the same sorts of things that you are familiar with as a teacher if you've had some access exposure to alternative proprietary solutions so obviously first and foremost positive reinforcement of the fact that there's no real difference between these platforms there's interoperability it's not a big deal anymore but then importantly we've got to realize that 75 percent of the teachers in namibia and most of africa are women and here i am an old white bloke talking about marketing to women and I think that's probably a fundamental flaw in the industry altogether. It's mostly old white men trying to market product to young men. And they've missed the boat completely when it comes to the education sector. In Africa, the education sector is mostly women. They are mostly in the age groups between 30 and 55. And they are not using computers. Now, why? I believe it is the fact that we are not marketing our product properly. We're missing the boat. Because women aspire to control and comfort and trust and respect for their intelligence embracing ICTs. Now that is something that none of the industry players are thinking about when they market their latest Celeron or Pentium processor. And that's something that we've got to change. And that in the way that we share this knowledge around what ICTs are, we've got to keep in mind, always in the back of the mind, that in an, in an African development context, the education sector is the most likely to embrace ICTs. Not the small market enterprises, not the, the little cooker shops and the little shabines and little things that crop up all along the streets all over Africa. It's not that kind of place. It's not the telecenters. Subsistence farmers do not spend money on internet and telecenters. They spend money on development funds to put their children through education. So let's make sure that the educators in Africa are actually empowered to use those computers because that's what's missing. Teachers do not come and sit in front of computers because they're not interested. And there's something wrong, and I think it's part of that is the way that we market those resources. Now, into high tea comics. We realized, this is a comic, there is a phenomenal comic culture in, in sub-Saharan Africa. People love comics, and we'd, we'd miss that. I mean, it was just one of those silly things that suddenly realized that, hey, why is it that whenever we send ma masses of manuals and documents and letters and encouragement and training sessions, face-to-face -face stuff, you name it, we don't get teachers to embrace technologies. And we realized that, first of all, the marketing was all wrong. But then secondly, is that people don't bother to read any of that stuff. They've got a 30-hour work week. They're not interested in reading great big manuals of how to use a spreadsheet. So we believe that with High T, the comic that we developed to meet this problem that teachers and other people were simply not reading manuals, that the comic providing foundation, integration, and amazingly also some community skills opportunities is the way, certainly from our point of view, in getting more and more teachers to start using computers in Namibia. And getting ultimately to what I believe is so, so important for you to think about, and what we believe is crucial, is to get teachers and students to do their own thing with the resources we provide. Now, the comic was launched in April last year.
uh, sorry, April this year. We had a school holiday in between, and we've had a constant monitoring of help desk queries. We have a knowledge base that grows daily with queries coming in from schools all over Namibia asking for problem solving from school net technicians. Surprisingly, in June, after the long vacation, there was a dramatic shift in the kinds of questions that were coming in through our toll-free number from schools. And surprisingly, more and more teachers were starting to ask about how do I use a word, word processor? What do I do with the spreadsheet? You've shown how to do a timetable in your comic. So we've seen dramatic change in the kinds of questions coming back to SchoolNet around the resources we've deployed. And we believe that it's got something to do with the way that we've designed and culturally adapted this particular resource to make teachers read comics. And teachers are reading comics. And we're starting to see that teachers are now starting to make their own blogs and develop little wikis and start to build activity worksheets and all sorts of things that are very much part of a culture that we as an organization would like to see with this free and open source platform use tools, stunning tools like Cool, Next Gen. Derek is in the audience here, I trust, and he's going to be talking about Cool. Are providing tools and resources that allow these teachers to use cut, copy, paste mentality and grab and drag and drop and do whatever else and build their own resources. Because at the end of the day, if these teachers are not localizing what is the wonderful generic stuff that's being produced out there to suit their local environments, we're still going to have problems in getting those teachers to share that resource with the kids. The kids would rather be downloading MP3s anyway. So let's find some ways, tools like NextGen, to allow for learning management systems that bring these opportunities very simplistically and very easily and transparently to, into the hands of teachers that now are empowered to use those computers. Localized activity worksheets and lesson plans were, were not available until literally two or three months ago. We put out some, some, some media, we advertised the idea that you could use computer technology, spreadsheets, word processes, and various other wonderful tools to build your own worksheets. And the result of that is that increasingly more teachers in Namibia and learners are doing blogs, wikis, but also building PDFs around very simple things. I mean, I don't know where that driving monkey sometimes crash buckies comes from, but a bucky is a pickup. So it makes you think. A kid would never have understood the word pickup, but a bucky is a bucky. It's a word that we use in Southern Africa. So obviously, there's some, something is, is changing. And I think that's part of this culture that we've created with SchoolNet in Namibia. And we trust that it will work further afield. Whether it's a simple PDF or a Word document, or whether it's a high-tech flash solution, I believe that this open source platform that we've made available to schools throughout Namibia considering all the barriers and considering all the, the fun, fundamental problems that we have there with policy and international <coughs> misunderstanding and all the rest, I believe that ultimately these teachers and these learners that get to use these ICTs justify what we've been trying to do for six years in Namibia and we're starting to see all over Africa. Africa needs a school net. Africa needs a school net to provide a platform which allows you with your content to share your resources with them. Thank you.